Thank you, Natalie Joy. <laughs> uh, so I'm a corporate trainer here at Enriched Academy. My name is Jess DiNardo. Also on the line, we have the lovely Natalie Joy Cannell, who is acting as my operator today. So she's going to be moderating our chat. She's going to be able to, uh, if there are any questions, she's going to be able to answer them as as we go, if she's able to. If not, after the presentation, I'm going to come back to the chat and also answer any questions that aren't able to be answered by NJ. Uh, we also have a Q&A box. So I do understand that sometimes talking about your finances can be something sensitive and private that you might not want to just put into a big chat that everyone can see. If you drop your questions into the Q&A box, you have A, the option to drop them in anonymously, or B, it's just that uh, Natalie Joy and I will be able to see them here from Enriched Academy to be able to answer those questions for you. And it won't be just for everyone who's in this training to be able to see. Uh, so Natalie Joy, I'm assuming we can hear me, we can see me. Do we have my slides up as well? It's not my presenter notes version. Oh, I see everything beautifully. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we are going to get started with how to raise money smart kids. And first of all, I want to thank you so much for being here. So obviously, if you're here, it's because you have kids that you want to set on the right track. If you're anything like me, you were raised by parents who didn't talk about money. And maybe you want to break those um, generational cycles and be able to move forward and help your kids really secure a strong financial future for themselves. So hooray that you're here. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, so first thing I do want to mention, I am a financial literacy educator. That means I the things I am not are a tax preparer, an, a lawyer. I'm not an investment advisor. I'm not an insurance salesperson. I am not an accountant. So all of this information that we provide for you today is for educational purposes only. So anything that you learn here today, if you need to run that through your own filters for financial advice, please do so. If you don't have a financial advisor and you're looking for one, this is brought to you in partnership with CISIP Financial. So CISIP Financial is there to help you and they are a unique service available to members of the CAF. So they're here just for CAF members and, and their families to participate in these uh, financial advisory in this financial advisory role to be able to help you with your finances moving forward. Financial advisors at CISIP Financial really understand all the different nuances of military life. You know, I know because I come from a military background that military life can be very, very different from civilian life, whether it's deployments or um, moving every few years. It's, there's a lot of challenges that you're presented with, and the financial advisors at CISIP are really well educated in that to be able to really help you move forward and have a plan for your finances. So whether it's anything from insurance to financial needs, financial education and counseling, savings, investments, they can help you with all of it. So if you have questions that involve like a bit more nuance, please do speak to them and we'll have a link at the end for how to get in touch with them as well. They do have a team that's all the way across the country. So if you, no matter where you're based, if you're in Canada, there is someone available from CISIP Financial to help you. And even if you're out can, you can also sign up through the link and they will connect you as well. So how to raise money smart kids. Now, full disclosure, I am not a parent. So I am do as I say, not as I do, because I don't have kids of my own. However, I do have nieces and nephews in my life. And I do, you know, talk quite uh, frankly, with them about money as well, because they do come to me with questions sometimes. So I do sort of know of what I speak. So, but your mileage may vary when it comes to dealing with your own children, of course. So why is it so important to teach our kids about financial literacy? We want our kids to be financially independent early in life. We also want to help them move out sooner. I mean, I'm sure you don't want your kids living with you until they're in their 30s. And nearly half of parents are still financially supporting their adult children in their 30s from a poll from RBC. So that was done in 2019. I'm sure with the cost of living being what it is, those numbers are probably even higher. So that's a, that's a little bit alarming. Yeah, 56% of young adults, according to The Guardian, still live at home. So... Also, you want to de avoid delaying your own retirement. If your kids are still living at home and you haven't planned for that, that's going to be a struggle for your retirement needs. Like if you wanted to retire at a certain age, but you've still got a 30-year-old living in your basement, that might be a little bit more difficult for you. So 32% of parents have 
uh, helped their uh, children with their post-secondary costs. Um, and it really slows their own ability to be able to pay off their debts or uh, be able to save for their future. And that's really, really important. So also, the, and this to me is the most important reason why you wanna teach your kids this, especially if they're younger. These are critical skills that will really help them build habits to help them grow their future success. Success, And they're gonna, they might learn that from other people sort of here and there, but watching their parents is how they're going to model that behavior. So it's gonna be really valuable for you to teach them those skills early on. 84% of graduates surveyed indicated that they needed more education on financial topics. And this is university graduates. So, you know, just because you're sort of doing a little bit or maybe they get a little bit in school, it's probably not enough. And so we really encourage you to really talk to your kids about money. So there's four steps for teaching your teenagers about money. First one, they need to earn an income. And you can help them do that. And we're going to talk about how. Second thing is to open those key financial accounts that are going to be really helpful to getting them on the right track with what they want to be doing. So you want to help them open up the right accounts. And we'll talk about what those are. Third thing is going to be creating an automated system. Learning these habits young. Let me tell you, I wish I had done this when I was younger because it really, really builds good habits and you want them to start investing. And we'll talk about how you can help them do that. So first thing to do is earn an income. Now, if your kids are anything like the kids that I know, they get money for birthdays and holidays. The teenagers that I know, I ask them what they want for Christmas, what they want for their birthdays, money. That's all money. They want to go shopping. They want money. That's it. Money. That's that's the only thing that they want. Just like this kid, he wants that birthday cash. Second option is maybe through an allowance and maybe doing chores around the house is how they earn that allowance. So whether it's doing the dishes or the laundry, washing the car, mowing lawns, maybe they're earning money that way. Now, I know some parents don't like to attach chores to allowance. So maybe those are two different things in your household. But if your child's, child does earn an allowance, that's another opportunity for income for them. So this is an average. So this was taken from Greenlight. So this is the average allowance by AIDS age for kids from five to 15. So you can see the range is around $6 on average for five-year-olds and about $17 on average for 15-year-olds. Just, just for fun, how many of you do this? Maybe throw a yes or no in the chat box if you give your kids an allowance. I'd love to, I'd love to hear it if you want to let me know if you're doing a uh, an allowance for your kids. No, you're not. Okay, that's that's fine. And pe lots of people have different opinions on allowances. I'm not saying one is better or worse than any other. I'm just curious. I had an allowance when I was growing up. It was $20 every two weeks, and I had to save a portion of it, and I had to put a portion of it aside for giving. But for the most part, I got to spend that $20, and that was pretty great. But we have a great system lined up, and we'll show you in just a second of how that uh, money can be distributed for your kids. Um, so these numbers are an average by age. So it really works out to a dollar or two dollars per week based on age. So if you do decide that you want to give your kids an allowance, that's fine. But it should be a choice that's based on what's realistic for your family's income and expenses. So if you do assign uh, an allowance to your children. Maybe there's also a uh, a caveat that goes with it that it's like, okay, well, this is your allowance money, but that means we're not paying for, you know, X, Y, Z. So that might be something uh, that you can that you can move towards with your kids. Allowances are really a teaching tool. They help you as parents help your kids understand how to manage their money. But if you're not ready to go down that step, maybe the answer for your child is getting a job depending on their age. Now all across Canada we do have different ages about as to where people how old people are when they're allowed to get their first job. Now I do see here that Prince Edward Island is 16 years old. I can tell you from experience that I was not 16 when I lived in Prince Edward Island and was 12 and got my first job picking strawberries. It was definitely illegal but it was a great summer and I had a lot of fun with my friends picking strawberries and making a little extra pocket money. So first, the top 10 first jobs that uh, people have had all across the country, babysitter, childminder. So that was something that I did as well when I was young, a cashier at maybe a grocery store, a paper route. I had friends that had a paper route. I wanted a paper route so badly, but it never happened for me. Uh, camp counselors, dishwashers, receptionists, office assistants, busing tables, fast food. 
Yes, I worked at McDonald's. I worked there for six years through high school and my first couple of years of university, uh, barista and retail store clerk. This is Jay Seabrook on the left in this photo here. He was an assistant dishwasher at age 12. So this was his first job. He's our co-founder. And uh, yeah, he started young just like I did. Um, so there's lots of different reasons why your teen might want to get a job and might, why you might want to empower your teenager to get a job as well. First reason is that they, so they can start investing more when they're younger and really take advantage of compound interest. And we'll get to that in just a little bit here. It also creates some freedom. Having freedom and responsibility at a young age teaches really, really good habits, habits and work ethic to be able to help them later on in life when they get to be adults. Again, learns really important life skills. You know, I worked at McDonald's for six years from the time I was 15 till the time I was 21, and I learned really great customer service skills. You know, it was the 90s, so customer service at McDonald's was a little different than it is now, but I learned some really good skills that have really helped me in a lot of my career moving forward forward from that. It helps you get better jobs faster. So once you've graduated from university, if that's the route that your kid goes, or if they've gone through college or whatever, having a work history from back when they're, you know, 15, 16 years old is really going to help them on their resume because it shows potential employers that they have a strong work ethic and that they wanted to get started young. It also helps create discipline. And this one is a big one, man. The I didn't realize what a favor my parents were doing for me when they'd never let me allow, never allowed me to call in sick to work unless I was actually, you know, really sick. And even then, sometimes it was tough to uh, to convince them that, no, I needed to stay home from my my job at McDonald's. So it it but it did create in me some discipline that I've really uh, appreciate now as an adult that, you know, even if I don't want to go to work, I know that that's the thing that I have to do. So there are some key tips for how to stand out in a job interview. So once your child gets to the interview stage, let's talk about how they can really uh, knock their socks off of the employer to make sure that they clinch that job. So the first thing that they want to do is create a resume that really stands out and bring copies with them. So let's say they're out with their friends, they go to, they stop by Starbucks and they happen to see a help wanted sign in the window. That might be a great opportunity for them to say, hey, can I speak to the manager? I've got a copy of my resume with me. Let me just give that to you right now, which is great. Now, obviously, a lot of places aren't taking on like, taking resumes in person anymore. There's lots of options for online job searching as well. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So you want to make sure they have a great resume that stands out and bring some copies with them. Second thing, and this may be a skill that you didn't realize that people had to learn, was to firmly shake the employer's hand. I worked in uh, residential real estate for 15 years, and I got really, really good at the handshake. And I'm sure if you work in the military, you are also very good at the handshake, because my dad, who's ex-military, taught me how to do a really good handshake. So that's a skill that you can teach your children of how to shake an employer's hand. Also, make lots of eye contact. I know that teens these days, at least the ones that I know, are very interior. They very much like to be looking at their phone. They don't love, especially if you're their parent or you're their aunt, they don't want to make eye contact with you. But you need to explain to them how important it is when they're applying for a job to make eye contact with the person who's making those decisions. Another thing, again, not great for teenagers to be able to do is using a loud, clear confident voice even if they don't feel like it when they're applying for these jobs. I know having to learn these skills when I was 15 years old, I was terrified just shaking in my little boots because I, I could not emotionally handle the, the loud voice. You'd be surprised because now I can do it quite well. Uh, also, avoid one word answers and be as descriptive as possible. So let's say your teenager uh, really likes to read. I'm thinking in particular of Natalie Joy's eldest, AJ, who is a bookworm. So if she's being asked in an interview, what are some of your hobbies? Rather than just say books, you know, she could say, oh, I like to read a lot and these are my favorite genres and this is my favorite writer and this is re what I'm reading right now to show an employer that they're engaged and enjoying the conversation that they're having. Next thing, and this is a really interesting thing that um, I don't think people do very often anymore, but mailing a handwritten thank you note after the interview can really get you a lot farther than you might think it, it would. So 
this is just an example. Obviously, this one's done by a computer because it's in cursive. And I know that kids, they just don't know how to write in cursive anymore. And that's fine. But a little handwritten note can really make a huge difference into making yourself a memorable and b for an employer to go, oh, this kid is really polite and kind and thoughtful and thinks about customer service and thinks about making people happy. So especially if they're applying for a customer service job, this could be a really, really great opportunity. Every job I have applied for where I've sent in a handwritten thank you note, I eventually got, and I am very, very proud of that fact. So uh, final step is follow up by phone. So call the employer. And again, I know kids don't want to be on the phone. They want to text, but call and avoid leaving, leaving a voicemail. If you at all can speak to the person directly and thank them for meeting with you and see if there's any follow up for getting an interview. Now, another thing to remember is when your kids do start earning money, that their money isn't all theirs. And the best way to teach them is by eating 30% of their ice cream, apparently, according to Bill Murray. So yeah, everything they get isn't theirs. There's a portion that's going to go to taxes. There's a portion they're going to have to save. And I encourage you to teach your children early and young about set, giving a portion of their earnings to charity. So the second step in this whole process is by is to open up those key financial accounts. So I know that BMO has a partnership with CISEP Financial to provide CAF members with no fee banking. I'm not sure if Carolyn's on the call because she said she may come, but I'm just wondering, I'm not sure if that's available to their families as well, but if so, we'll make sure that we get that information to you. So you wanna make sure that you've opened for your child a checking, and a savings account, as well as an investment account. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So the third step is gonna be creating an automatic system, automated, automated, automated. So the money from their allowance or their job goes right into their checking account, 40%. Now these numbers are ones that we recommend. They're not ones that maybe work for your family, but if it does, this is great. 40% goes right from their checking account into their investment account every month. And then 10%, goes to a charity of your child's choice every six months. So this is a really great opportunity to teach your children about charity and, ch and charitable giving early on in life. Then you wanna make it sure it's automated. So your job pays you, money goes into the checking account, then automatically investment account. Oh, there's a spelling error in this slide I just noticed. I need to, uh, to fix that. It's an invest account, not an investment account. And then 10% goes to a charity of their choice every six months. That also really gives your child some um, autonomy and helps them learn like, oh, I can decide where my money goes. If we're going to be giving to a charity, they can, you know, research what charities are important to them, what causes are important to them. Fourth step is to get them to start investing. And if you don't invest right now as a parent, this can be really scary and hard to understand. So we're going to give a little brief overview here. But please, if you are interested in learning more about investing, there is a module inside of the Wealth Mastery Portal, which you have access to. There's a link to it in the chat. There's a module in there on investing. There is also always CISIP Financial to help you with this piece of it. You know, whether that's stocks and bonds or mutual funds, please make sure you're speaking to a professional to make sure you're making the right decisions for your family. So most famous investor in the world, I would argue, is Warren Buffett. And he bought his first investment at 11. He said he was wasting his life up until then. Maybe a little dramatic. I would argue that a childhood is not a waste of your life, but this is how Warren Buffett sees it, and so be it. So you can see here, he started investing young. You know, at 14 years old, his net worth was about $5,000, which is pretty great for a 14 year old. But when you got up here to a 90 year old, he's worth over $100 billion. That's really saying something. Now you can see here on this chart, it doesn't really start to explode until he's 52. And once he hits that 52 year old mark, Mark, you see it really, really rapid growth happen on to his investments. And that's what we're hoping is going to really happen for your children. So if you take $50 invested monthly, you start at 15 years old, the value at retirement is $396,000, almost $400,000 investing that $50 a month. But if you wait for 10 years, 
you're going to lose out on more than half of that. And that's the power of compound interest, which is the money that your money makes and then the money that that money makes. The more and more you can put in, the more and more um, compound interest you're going to benefit from. You see here, if you if you wait until 35 to start doing this, then you're going to be down by, you know, more than two thirds of the value. So these, this is based on an annual growth rate of 8%, which is pretty aggressive. So obviously your mileage may vary. We want to keep that in mind. So what do you invest in? How, how do you invest? What do you invest? How do you invest? What's a stock? So a stock going to the very basics is a very, very small piece of ownership in a company. So when you're explaining this to your kids, one company that all kids understand is Disney and you can purchase stock in Disney. They used to send these out when you purchased a stock. Sadly, they don't anymore because uh, I think it would be really cool to have one of these, but this is a stock. It is a piece of the ownership of Disney. So in 1990, when you, they went public is when people were first able to start buying stocks and Disney has performed exceptionally well. So if you invested in Disney in 1990, you are doing really, really well today. And why is it that they've done so well? It's because they have branched out so much. So they opened their first park in 1955 and they've really successfully been able to test markets and figure out new things that will help bring them income. So most recently they've added cruises, but they've been really great with adopting digital platforms and making sure that, you know, their streaming sites are on track and getting all this stuff done for them to bring in more and more and more money. So if you buy a stock in Disney, what does that mean? So this is Robert Iger. He is the big boss at Disney. He employs over 220,000 people. But if you own a share of stock in Disney, Robert works for you. You are his boss. You are a shareholder. And that means you get to help decide where the income goes and what happens with the money that you've invested in that company. So that's just a very brief overview of stocks. Please know it is a lot more complicated than that. I'm not saying go and buy Disney, but just to give you an idea of how stocks work. So this is one of our, uh, our clients, Maya. So she is at 15 years old. She was making $13 an hour, working 15 hours a week, which means she was making $195 a week, $780 a month, with a yearly income of $9,360, so just under $10,000. So with that, she saves 40%, $3,744. She spends 50%. So that's her pocket money. That's her walking around money. And really, how much pocket money does a 15-year-old need? Probably not all that much. And she gives 10% of her income. So of that uh, three thousand seven hundred and forty-four dollars. When she, if you assume an eight percent return on her investments at age fifteen, she'd have three thousand seven hundred and forty-four dollars. But at age twenty-five, not having put any more into it after that first year, she'd have eighty-eight thousand three hundred and ten dollars. At forty-five years old, that would be worth. $40,000, which is a significant jump. And at age 65, if she leaves that money alone, she's got $201,000. Now that's a $4,500 difference at age 25, a $22,000 difference at age 45, and a $110,000 difference at age 65. Now, total invested, $3,744. Total interest paid is almost $200,000. It is a vast amount. So let's say now you want to do this monthly. Your monthly income, $780 a month. And you want to put the same amount into savings every month. So you want to save $250 a month, and the rest is split between spending and giving. So the first investment at age 15, you've got $3,000 on there. Again, this is assuming an 8% return. At age 25, having put in $250 a month, a month for those 10 years, it's worth $46,000. At age 45, $375,000. And drum roll, please, at age 65, 
almost two million dollars, saving two hundred and fifty dollars a week. And that's a or sorry, a month rather. And that's a really good habit to get into when you're fifteen. You know, as you're when you're fifteen, if you're already saving two hundred and fifty dollars a week, it gets easier to do as your income increases. You always remember, oh, I've budgeted that two hundred and fifty dollars a month. I'm going to set it aside. That means I get to spend what is left. So yeah, seeing this here, this is a huge difference. And yeah, total investment is $150,000 and they're sitting at almost $2 million rather of investments. So how to set up an investment account for your child. So if your child decides that the investment route is the way they wanna go, they can have what's called an in-trust account. So this is a type of trust account that's designed to hold and manage the assets for a minor until they reach the age of majority. So once they turn 18, that account becomes theirs and you just it just gets transferred over to them at 18 years old. Quest Trade, Wealth Simple, both types of accounts that you can do this with. It's it's such an easy simple thing to set up for your child. I would also actually speak to Sysa Financial as well because I think you also might want to look into a registered um, education account for them as well. It's another opportunity for investments that might be actually a really good one. If I had known this stuff when I was 15, you know, my mother had always given me the compound interest calculator example at $100 a month. And to me in the 90s, that seemed like an exorbitant amount of money. So I thought, well, what's the point of doing anything then? But even if I had just done $20 a month, that would have been better than nothing. And I really wish I had paid attention to that in the 90s. So if you could go back in time and learn these lessons when you were a teenager, what would you have learned? You know, there's all kinds of things that we could take away from this when we were younger. But if we can't, the next best thing is to be able to pass that on to our kids. So that concludes the module. So let's look at some of these action steps that you can take. So the first thing that you wanna do is make some time to sit down with your kids and start talking to them about money. I know this can be really difficult if you haven't done it before. And I know that the topic of money can sometimes be really dry. You have older teens, maybe sign up for the Wealth Mastery Portal and sit and watch the videos with them. They're gonna get some great takeaways from it. They're gonna be able to learn from it. Please take advantage of that. They can absolutely sit down with you and watch these videos and work through the exercises with you. It gives you a really great opportunity to be transparent with your kids about money and how money works and how the household finances work as well. Second opportunity, if you've got younger, littler ones, is maybe to watch the videos in the portal yourself and disseminate some of the information to them that you've learned in easier to understand terms. So second thing that you can do with your older kids is help them find their first job, including that interview prep, like I mentioned, make sure they know how to shake hands. It's very, very important. Next thing that we would love to see you do is make a family activity out of going to open the key financial accounts for your child. I still remember going to the bank to open my first bank account with my mother. It was the Bank of Montreal in Trenton when my dad was posted there. It was I, I can see it. I can smell it. I can see the day when we went and did that. It was a very big deal to me to be able to do that because I felt so grown up. Fourth thing you're going to want to do is teach your kids how to implement and automate all of their savings and get things rolling for them. So we've got two different ways that you can access these things that we've talked about today. So on the left, and these links are also in the chat box as well. On the left, we've got our free education portal. Please scan that link, sign on up, or click the link in the chat box to get signed up for the free education portal pilot program. So we've got uh, four units in there on finances, as well as two bonus units, all kinds of tools that you have access to, to help you and your family really get your finances sorted out and to be able to teach your kids some of these skills with money as well. If you'd like to speak to a professional assistant financial, which I highly encourage that you do, they're great there. They really know what they've got going on. It's the QR code here on the right, or it's the second link there in the chat box. If you have any questions about your family's insurance needs, savings accounts, investments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they are the ones for you. Now, here we go. Um, I'm back into the, the chat and I'm able to look at the chat. What's going on here? Oh, thank you, Natalie Joy, for finding this thing about the community banking. I really appreciate you finding that. 
Uh, so their families are eligible for the no fee banking. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm just going to check the Q&A box here to see if we have any questions as well. If people want to ask questions privately, we do not. Nobody's looking to answer, ask any questions there. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead, drop that in the chat box or drop that in the Q&A box if you'd like a little bit more anonymity. Uh, again, my name is Jess DiNardo. I'm a corporate trainer with Enriched Academy. I'm just gonna drop my email address here in the chat as well. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, directly and we're happy to answer them. We also have Natalie Joy on the line today and she is fabulous. So she is support at enrichedacademy.com. And if you have any questions about accessing the portal and you're not able to do it for whatever reason, please know Natalie Joy can answer all of your questions very, very capably. I do see we have some people typing. Typing um, Is this being recorded to be sent out again later? So yes, we are. As this is the pilot project, we've been having some little hiccups when it comes to the recordings. But as soon as we have our recording set and ready to go, we will be sending it out to everybody who not only attended today, but who also registered and maybe weren't able to attend for whatever reason. I love that you, uh, you're welcome, Crystal. I'm, I love that you are enthusiastic about it. I really hope that there's lots of information that you can take out of this to take to your, to your family as well. So if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes to see if anybody's going to be typing or anything. No, nope, looks like we're, uh, Looks like we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Oh, we've got someone typing. I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna be missing a question here um, before I sign off. Thank you, Natalie Joy, for taking care of us today and moderating our chat for me. I really appreciate that. How do we get a recording? It'll be sent out to you if you are in attendance today and here you are. So absolutely, it will be sent to you once we figure out all of that side of things. So thank you so much for coming today, guys. I'm going to let you all go back to your day and uh, looking forward to uh, talking to you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.